That's very kind of you. I'm here every week, actually. But, um, <laughs> good evening, everyone. I'm Matthew Taylor. I'm Chief Executive of the RSA. I'm absolutely delighted to welcome you here tonight for the 2019 Albert Medal Award. Um, before we begin, can you turn your phone to silent? We're filming this evening and streaming live over the web, so a very big welcome to those of you who are joining us online. And a reminder that the hashtag, and please get a conversation going, on Twitter is RSA Community, if you'd like to get involved in that online conversation. So the RSA has awarded the Albert Medal for innovation in the fields of creativity, enterprise, and particularly social innovation since 1864. Recent past recipients include the business pioneer James Timpson, the community organizer Neil Jameson, uh, the Just Giving founder Zareen Karas, and the campaigner Peter Tatchell. The Albert Medal is um, recognized as a means of identifying and rewarding those at the forefront of practical social innovation, those inspirational heroes who are driven by a desire to make the world a better place. And I am personally, and we are, delighted to award this year's medal to Paul Stinson Hewitt. Paul is founder of Parkrun, the unique social initiative which organizes free, weekly, five-kilometer time runs all around the world. Paul's mission, and that of Parkrun, is to make the world a healthier and happier place through the interventions of the thousands of volunteers who take part. Central to the RSA's work are the concepts of inclusivity and engagement, so we're looking forward to hearing from Paul this evening on this uniquely accessible and social initiative which has opened the possibility of well-being and social cohesion to everyone. This type of approach is vital in navigating the complex challenges we face as communities and in developing a shared mission for progress. So, Paul, it gives me great pleasure to present you with the 2019 Albert Medal for building a global participation movement, and we're also delighted to award you an honorary life fellowship of the RSA. That's the easy bit. <laughs> now, Paul, we are looking forward to hearing more of your groundbreaking, uh, groundbreaking work. But I think before we start, just to make you feel at home, let's just see how many people in the room are park runners. Put your hands up. You are, Paul, amongst friends. <laughs> over, over to you. Matthew, thank you very much. That's a wonderful um, accolade, and I really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much for joining us uh, today in this wonderful celebration of the Parkrun journey. This was never part of my plans. We didn't start with a grand, all-encompassing plan for world domination. <laughs> I simply invited my friends to the park because I was a bit lonely. This was not part of the plans. It wasn't supposed to happen. I had no idea that other people's lives would be affected by this little seed that I planted. For what started as an excuse to be with my friends at a time when I really needed them close, to have become a global phenomenon will always be extraordinary to a South African computer programmer who liked to run. I will never be per comfortable with personal accolades that I'm given, but over time I've got used to the idea that Parkrun is something special, that this event I created, mostly for my own health and happiness, has become a movement that has had such a positive impact on so many people's lives. It's not uncommon for someone to tell me that parkrun for them has been the difference between living and dying, literally. But I've not done this alone. 
I would not be here tonight without the contribution of countless others. At the heart of my story and of Park Run's story is something that I firmly believe in, that people are good. Time and time again over the last 15 years, I've been overwhelmed by the powerful displays of the human spirit as people have come together on Saturday and Sunday mornings, sharing our wonderful parks and open spaces and being active together. Unlike some previous luminaries to have received this prestigious award, I did not have an Euroco mo moment. Although, like many of them, I was simply solving a problem for myself. I was going through a difficult time in my life, and running was the constant that kept my head above water. And suddenly, thanks to an injury, I couldn't do it anymore. What I knew in 2004 was that I personally had a need to be active, to be outdoors, and to be social. What I didn't know was that so did everybody else. Like most great things in life, Parkrun is a very simple concept. Free, weekly, community-led, socially focused events where you can walk, jog, run, volunteer, or spectate. We used the timed run as a hook to get people involved, but it never, was never really about that. Absolutely anyone is welcome to participate in some way. And it's not unusual to see four generations of the same family all taking part on the same day, from a five-year-old great-grandchild to a 95-year-old great-grandparent. Parkrun brings people together in a way too often overlooked by modern society, in a way that I so desperately needed in 2004, and in a way that empowers the most wonderful aspects of the human spirit, it offers everyone the opportunity to involve themselves in something positive, constructive, and joyful, to be part of their community and to contribute to the health and happiness of their fellow humans. In an ever more frantic and lonely world, thousands of families every week use their local park run to spend time together, leaving the stresses of everyday life behind and reconnecting with loved ones. And all of this happens every single week in a park local to you. From what started out 15 years ago as 18 friends met in a park, 13 runners and five volunteers, we expect that by the end of this year, over four million different people will have walked jogged, run, or volunteered over 60 million times at 2,000 parks and open spaces across 21 countries. It was several years ago when I realized that in order to achieve our dream, we would need to become a single global family, bound together by our common desire to make the world healthier and happier. Importantly, also at that time, I realized that our wonderful community had outgrown my capabilities. And if we were going to succeed, we would need the leadership of someone with an exceptional balance of skills and experience. When in May 2015, I appointed Nick Pearson as our CEO, I removed myself from the day-to-day -day running of the organization. This was possibly the most challenging moment of my life. As Parkrun was only 11 years old, and it felt like my own child. This thing that I had nurtured for 11 years, seen grow up through good times and bad, needed to take the next steps, and largely without me. I found it desperately hard to accept that Park Run could and should run without me. But the more and more I thought about it, the more I realized it was the only option. Today, we have 43 staff all around the world, 
still an incredibly small team given the level of impact that the park run delivers and a team that I'm immensely proud to call colleagues and friends but it's no longer me that leads that team. Great movements on trajectories to change the world are so often brought down by their founders who hang on too long suffocating the spirit of their creation. In my case, I recognized that the skill set I possessed, which was so critical to creating Park Run and guiding it through it, the turbulent times of our first 10 years, was not the same skill set required to match the completely different set of challenges faced by a global movement with many millions of members. Under Nick's leadership, Park Run has achieved so many of my dreams in ways I could never have imagined. We now have 27 events in custodial estates around the world where people who have perhaps never before had the opportunity to contribute to their community now join our various milestone clubs and we hope they find Parkrun as a catalyst for making better life choices in the future. We also have 1,400 GP practices signed up as official Parkrun practices and encouraging those most in need of a community to join them on a Saturday or Sunday morning to walk, jog, run, volunteer or spectate, becoming hugely valued and much loved members of their local communities. We've achieved far greater success in international territories with many more in the pipeline whilst protecting our existing communities from the risk associated with growing too quickly. And we've made huge strides towards achieving a financial model that empowers us to keep Parkrun free for everyone, forever. In 2011, we saw 100 Parkrun events across a single weekend for the very first time which although is a somewhat arbitrary milestone, it did represent a time when we were suddenly required to grow up. Within five years, we would be 10 times that size with 1,000 weekly events and to get there, we needed to <coughs> redefine how we operated. During this time, we began to understand the complexities of scale and how things that had previously never happened were becoming regular occurrences. And as our growth began to accelerate, we were in great danger of being brought down by our own success. At the same time, we realized that volunteering, far from being a necessary evil required to, to enable others to participate, was a wonderful form of community participation in its own right and contributed so much to people's lives. During this time, I appointed Tom Williams to the staff team and it was Tom who drove the huge benefits of volunteering to the volunteers themselves. We began to change the narrative around community engagement and understood that for our events to succeed, it was vital that they were supported everywhere by local people with a passion for changing the world. Today, we have a global volunteer network in excess of half a million different people contributing uh, around 50,000 weeks, uh, sorry, contributing around 50,000 hours every single week, and that's about 2.6 million volunteer hours per year, or the equivalent of 1,300 full-time staff. Parkrun has always been egalitarian, and it has always empowered people to feel they can participate. In fact, it couldn't exist without participation. However, Whilst the park run is a concept that anyone can grasp, and similarly, the delivery model is pretty straightforward and simple, keeping it simple has proved to be monumentally difficult. Since 2011, Tom has strived to simplify what we do, encouraging us all to spend time reflecting on our journey and developed our understanding of what matters and importantly, what doesn't. When you surround yourself with positive people, desperate to help others to do good things, it can become all too easy to say yes to the never-ending demands and requests, 
all the time distracting you from what's truly important. As a result of this focus, we now benefit from operational processes and practices that, for example, on this Christmas Day, are likely to support in excess of 100,000 people coming together in the celebration of the human spirit. Fortunately, in 2004, Christmas Day was on a Saturday. And at that time, we were already into our routine. So we headed to Bushy Park, where around 30 of us spent an hour or so together. In those early years, many people couldn't understand why park run uh, happened on a Christmas day. Why would we park on Christmas day? Explaining that it was a time for family and not for running. What we've come to understand over the years is that park run is family. And for many people, it's their only family. Never is this highlighted more than on Christmas Day. When for so many people, parkrun is the only human interaction they will have. Excuse me. It has been through empowering people like Tom to make decisions, to move things forward, and to provide alternative opinions that we've managed to redefine parkrun from a 5K time trial for runners to the egalitarian movement it has become. Building a successful team meant surrounding myself with great people whom I trusted and respected, not just people like me. But even more importantly, it meant giving them the support to apply their own vision, to celebrate their successes, and to share their failures. When I first started Bushy Park, or as some people know it, Bushy Park Time Trial, I was largely motiv by, motivated by selfish means. I was lonely and I needed my friends. Fairly quickly, I realized that my simple model of event delivery was something that could be applied anywhere and everywhere. And I fully expected others to replicate it, what my friends and I were doing every Saturday. Over time, however, it became apparent that the easiest way for another event to start was by joining us, benefiting from our knowledge, learning from our experiences, and building our family. By empowering communities, I realized that we were creating much more than running events. We were creating a movement. And by the, at the end of 2007, I realized that there could be a park run in every town in the world, a grand vision. Some might say a delusional vision, <laughs> considering we only had a handful of events and a few hundred participants in one country. Nevertheless, and perhaps critical to our success, was that whilst keeping that vision in the back of our minds, we focused one week at a time. A great example of that is our results and timing system. On day one, I stood there with a stopwatch and a clipboard, timing my friends, writing their names down, publishing the results using emails and Excel. As more people came along, I realized that they were coming back. So I would write people's, down, people's names down in advance, print them out, and then people would write their own finishing position next to their name. Before long, each event was required to print out the full list of parkrun registrations every Saturday morning, which, by the way, required 80 sides of A4 with four columns of names on each side. From there, and by event number four, I had written our own software to manage this digitally. And shortly after that, we converted it to an online live system for results processing, which we still use today. By iterating our processes week to week, and by focusing on efficiency and solving actual problems, we navigated from a single event in my park to a global movement with opportunities across the world. As a society, I believe we must consider how we deal with the ever-growing epidemic of medical issues related to modern sedentary lifestyles. We must continue to understand that our health, our mental health, is not a problem that affects an unfortunate few people different from us. 
Instead, it's an aspect of everyone's health that needs attention, maintenance, and nurture. As we grapple with the impacts of these things on our services, our GPs, our hospitals, our whole health and welfare system, we've realized that Parkrun offers communities all over the UK, in fact, all over the world, a self-help model. It seems to me that individuals respond far better to empowerment of being able to solve problems for themselves rather than having solutions imposed upon them. And maybe that's one of the reasons that Parkrun has been such a runaway success. Over time, we've seen Parkrun Park Run dramatically improve the physical and mental health of hundreds of thousands of people. Some people even describe it as the most significant UK public health initiative of the 21st century. But maybe one of the very reasons for its success is that it is not a public health initiative. It's a movement. It's a popular movement. It's a movement of real people and communities empowering themselves and those around them to do positive things for themselves and one another. But why are so many people coming together? Why is it that Parkrun's growth around the world shows no sign of slowing down? There is something magic that happens when a Parkrun community gets together, a community empowered to be there for each other, to welcome and support each other, that guarantees to be there for each other week after week. That community becomes a haven of positivity and joy a chance for people to escape, to do something for themselves, to reconnect with nature and to engage in something worthwhile and positive together. I guess maybe it works because too often modern life can feel like the complete opposite. That modern life is more likely to lead to isolation, to exclusion and to individualism. A perception that took that people look after themselves first without concerns for others. I believe that the natural human state is the opposite. It is to support each other, to care for each other, to love each other, regardless of background, ability or belief. I've always struggled with inequality I was born in Zimbabwe in 1960 and grew up in South Africa during apartheid. My childhood was not a happy one. But if it left me with one thing, then it was a passionate belief that everyone deserves a chance, that everyone should be treated equally. I guess that's why we had prizes for the first finishers and the last finishers at that very first Bushy Park time trial in 2004. And equality and fairness is something that I have tried to ensure is at the heart of Parkrun's values. And as we grew, that these values were embedded in the organization. Since that very first day, our sense of equality has informed how we celebrate and recognize volunteers and how walkers and runners are treated equally regardless of finish time or fitness level. It manifests itself in the way that, for example, a 14-year-old empowered to lead an, uh, an event volunteer team and to address hundreds of adults with nothing more than a loud hailer. And this is normal to us. It's entirely normal for us to see this sort of thing at Park Run. It isn't normal elsewhere, but it could be. I admit that I didn't want to focus on volunteering. Instead, I wanted to focus on running. I even tried to minimize the volunteering to ensure that the whole event was kept low key. But over time, I realized that people wanted to be involved. The desire to do something positive for others that in turn ends up being something incredibly positive for the individual became more and more obvious. Now we've shifted our position to that of wanting to maximize volunteering, confident that some of the greatest health and well-being benefits are to exp be experienced by those who volunteer at Parkrun events. 
I've heard it said that I'm uncompromising and stubborn, and I think that that's probably true. You can laugh. <laughs> However, these were valuable characteristics supporting us on our journey to where we are today. I will say I've never tried to do this alone. I realized very early on that by empowering others and trusting in others that more people would understand and believe in what we're doing and then adopt our values and culture. Parkrun is a collection of indiv empowered individuals coming together as empowered communities, being supported and encouraged by empowered teams of volunteers. Empowerment hands responsibility and accountability to you, to the individual, to the community, and to you, the team. By empowering communities to deliver their own events, to find local volunteers, to support local people to become healthy and happier, individuals feel more relevant. There's empathy and there's understanding. Participating is infinitely more achievable when you feel there's empathy and understanding. Accountability and responsibility makes us feel good. I'm being trusted to do something positive. I'm personally responsible for the po positive outcome. It's a virtuous loop featuring trust and positive re uh, reinforcement. I believe that an environment where you're trusted, where you're championed for making decisions, where you're celebrated for your achievements, fosters an environment where health and happiness is the outcome and the true human spirit is revealed. Being awarded this medal, the Albert Medal, is a huge, huge honor. Parkrun has grown to a level that nobody could have comprehended a little over 15 years ago when 18 people met in that South London car park. A small group of friends has become a global movement it's a wonderful story, but the real story is that the movement has only just begun. In October this year, we celebrated our 15th birthday, and by the end of this year, as I mentioned before, 4 million people will have participated 60 million times. However, as we look forward, attempting to consider our true opportunity and the challenge that lies ahead of us, we see unprecedented growth as our family expands around the world. By our 30th birthday, in just 15 years' time, we expect to be operating in over 50 countries across 10,000 locations, and 100 million people will have participated 1 billion times. That sounds crazy. Some would say delusional. <laughs> but we firmly believe that we have only just begun and that we will never be this small again. Empowering people around the world to come together every week and to do something for them, uh, positive for themselves and for those around them. My talk today was structured in such a way as to work backwards, to funnel down to Parkrun's essence and to those people who so supported me right from its conception. And so it all comes back to Joanne. <coughs> Throughout this process, Joanne has been my constant she supported me when it was unclear that Parkrun had a future, or even a present. When many others questioned my approach to the direction we were taking, Joanne knew and understood my heart. Yes, she thought it was a crazy idea when I said, we're going to commit to be in the park every Saturday from now on forever. <laughs> but then so did everybody else. However, when the big challenges came, which they did, and when we suffered disappointments, which we did, Joanne quietly comforted and supported me. She celebrated my achievements and shared my failures. Always at my side, 
my best friend and my pillar in difficult times. Joanne, you've supported me throughout, even when none of this made sense. Joanne and I try to get to a park run every weekend, and it's wonderful to speak to fellow park runners. People always want to thank me and say, Park run did this, Park run improved my health, Park run helped me find friends or feel part of a community. And that's wonderful. But really, they did it. Every decision they made, they took themselves. They just needed the opportunity. As I've already said, and at the heart of my story, and of Park Run's story, there is something that I firmly believe in. People are good. Thank you. People say you shouldn't meet your heroes, but uh, uh, Paul, you have lived up to my very high expectations. You don't want to be Prime Minister, do you? <laughs> um, so uh, this is going to be a bit difficult for me, really, because A, I just want to talk to you, and there's all these people who want to ask questions, but, um, and B, I want to ask you all sorts of nerdy questions about part run, because, you know, I am a part runner. Um, so I'll try to resist those temptations, but I will uh, fail, I'm sure, on a couple of occasions. Uh, I'm going to ask you a few questions, then I'll open it up to the, to, to the rest of the room. So let me ask you a really silly question, first of all. You've bon done part runs all around the world. Which is your favorite? <laughs> it, it is a question I get asked on a regular basis, and I have a stock answer, which is I'm not allowed to have a favorite. But the truth is, um, I but start... You must, have, you, have you gone back to South Africa to do part runs? Yeah, yeah. That must, be, must have been powerful for you, coming from South Africa and then going... And I think there's one or two that are really beautiful, particularly in South Africa. Oh, there are plenty of beautiful. There, we have 2,000 parks in the world, and I would say that 2,001 of them are beautiful. Um, now, so I, I started Bushy Park Run, and in my mind I had this vision of an inner-city park run. Okay, it's not quite inner-city. Burgess Park Run is more inner-city. But in my mind, it was uh, lots of people would live there and they'd just walk into the park and they'd do the park run. And, and so uh, there are lots and lots of beautiful parks that I've run in and there are lots and lots of parks that are very basic and uh, you know, running around a field. And for me, the most wonderful experiences are not the ones that offer you natural beauty, they're the ones that offer you the true beauty that I've been talking about, the beauty that comes out of people who attend. Communities are incredible. Uh, it's not always the case, but I would say 99% of the time, it's the people who turn me from a grumpy odd sod in the morning to something that really is quite engaging and, and interested in, in being there. Now, one of the things I loved about your, annual, your last annual report was that you celebrated the fact that the average time has got um, slower. Yeah. which is <laughs> such a brilliant uh, thing. Uh, so therefore, I'm just saying that to put in context the fact that I am going to ask you what your personal best for this year is. <laughs> for this year? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I don't know what that is. Oh, okay. It's probably around 20 minutes. Mm. My, my personal best at Park Run is 1822. Yeah, that's why I, I can too. tell no, you that. No, no. <laughs> I, the reason I asked about this year, Paul, was because I wanted, I was hoping I might be able to I'm match you, but unfortunately, times. I still, I can't get there. Um, was there a moment one particular moment when all of this might not have happened? I mean, maybe right at the beginning, you know, you talked about Joanne's support for you. That first one might not have happened, or the second one might not have happened, or whatever. Was, I mean, I'm almost kind of about it, the, the, the excitement of, in a sense, the, or the fear that, that somehow none of this could have occurred. Was there a moment? Absolutely. I think there have been a few along the way. Um, I've spoken a little bit about important things that happened when Tom and Nick came on board. Um, but I would suggest that first one happened because I was in a very negative place in my life and uh, it felt 
natural to want to just go out into the park and be outdoors doing something physical, although I couldn't run. I could be with my friends who were running and then go for coffee. And, you know, it, maybe the first day it was maybe a total of an hour, but that grew to two hours and eventually became three. And sometimes we wouldn't leave the coffee shop before lunch. I would say if I hadn't been injured and been in such a dark place, I might not have considered that it was my time to give something back. But it was that time, and I did want to give something back, uh, even if I know it was intentionally to help me. It, it's interesting you say that, Paul, because that idea that at that moment of adversity, that, that, that your generosity to organize something for your friends to be with your friend is critical. I mean, I, I have to say that your speech was full of the most amazing insights, actually. It, 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 you know, there's so many things to carry away from that about why this has worked. And you may be an intuitive genius, but nevertheless, you know, those different components, the way they've come together, is quite amazing. Now, one of them is, is this kind of... And I got this when I read your speech when you sent it to me a few days ago, that this emphasis on volunteering being as important as the emphasis on the sport and kind of health uh, side um, of, of, of that. Um, I, you know, one of the things I love when I do part run is, and not everybody does it, but when we run past the volunteers, there's a kind of habit of saying thank you to them as we, as we, run, as we run past them. Um, you said that you didn't yourself quite understand how important volunteering was until a, a particular moment, but, some, but now the way you talk about it, it's, even, it's almost the most important part of it. Well, I think all the elements are equally important. Let me just put it that way. If, this thing couldn't happen without, I used the word participation. Participation we define as an e equal platform. You can run, you can spectate, you can volunteer, you can jog, you can walk, you can do all these things, and it's all equal. It is true that uh, when I started Park Run, there were competing forces. There were the clubs and the races and the governing body, and everybody wanted volunteers and so my natural instinct was let's just get in and out the park as quick as we can we're not going to stick up anything we everybody will take responsibility for themselves we've got people in this room who are all part of that right in those early days and uh, and the truth is we we did that for a while but in 2007 i had to go to start our second park run and i handed over my baby, Bushy Park Run, to my friend Duncan Gaskell, who happens to be here tonight. And uh, in that moment, I was handing the responsibility of everything that we now know over to one person. And so this concept that other people could take charge and be involved and they could do it the same way I wanted them to do it, and so that all started then. I would say, though, it was Tom Williams who when he came on board, started challenging me about hiding the volunteering, playing it down. We, we knew by then that it was an important and functioning part of what we did, but, but we still weren't celebrating it. And Tom changed the narrative. He just said, hang on a second, volunteering is probably the most valuable, most uh, self-benefiting act that you can do. Turn it into a positive. And so that's where it all came from. So this is where I'm going to get really nerdy. Um, why don't you use social proof a bit more in the way that you encourage people to volunteer? So I'm, I've run in various places in Clapham, in, in South London, Clapham, Tooting, Rockwell Park. And there's often a kind of call that goes out, because I, I volunteer uh, from time to time, and there's a call that goes out to volunteer, and it's often expressed in terms of, you know, we desperately need two or three more people. So my little rule for myself is that I'll volunteer one in every 10 times I run because Clapham, there's 700 of us, and I think you need kind of 30 volunteers, or we need 30, 30 or 40 volunteers. But I've often thought, why don't you just encourage us a little bit more? Like, for example, if when you, sent, when, when you looked at the times, it had in brackets how often people had volunteered, that would probably, in a gentle way, because if everyone did what I did, if everyone did one in 10 you would never be in the situation of emailing people on a Thursday, not you personally, but emailing people on a Thursday going, we need three or four people or else might not be able to do it. It used it. to be me. Yeah. 
So, so I don't think using a bit of what, as I say, behavioral economists have called social proof. You know, most of us do it, so why don't you do it as well? I don't think that would undermine the principle. So, so the fact is we do recognize that volunteering is as important as anything else, and we do want to celebrate it in exactly or in the same way that we do it all other parts of it. But, you know, we've been doing this for 15 years and we started down a certain track and we've grown and we've listened to what people have had to say and we've made changes all along the way and we still continue to do this. So this is a topic that is being discussed and is under review and constantly quite a lot of thought is going into it. But, just want to say uh, that what I was most worried about was that I would publish your volunteering, but not your volunteering, because you hadn't done any, and how it would make you feel under pressure because you do not have a volunteer number next to your name. And that's a very, very big part of us being fair to everybody, getting everybody involved. Mm. My very first encounter with this was, a, there was a chap called Stephen Instone who was a, from my club, he was a regular park runner, he was marching towards the 100 uh, T-shirt, the recognition, the milestone. And my colleagues, some of whom are in the room tonight, we would discuss it on a regular basis. And the, the discussion was, how can you possibly award him with a, a running shirt, a 100 volunteer, a 100 running shirt, when he hasn't ever volunteered? And I remember the conversation. It was very clear to me. I said, look, I don't know what goes on in Stephen's life. I don't know whether he has a disabled child that he has to look after Monday to Friday throughout the week. This is his only opportunity to come and run. I just don't know. And we have to be a bit more egalitarian about how we think about people and how we reward them. Not to say that we don't think this is an issue that we should constantly work on. We would like our volunteers to feel as equally rewarded as our runners. See, this is one of the kind of design elements of it. I mean, you didn't design it. You've, well, you've, it's, it's continuously evolved, and that's its power, it seems to me. But th this kind of balance of principles. So there's a kind of element of purism, but there's a lot of pragmatism. Another thing which I think is interesting kind of dichotomy is that the, the power of part room is, on the one hand, that it's completely accessible, that anybody can turn up wearing anything in any kind of physical state, and do it at whatever speed they want to. On the other hand, most of us who do it are really competitive. You know, we, we want to be as fast as we can. And I shifted from doing the Clapham Park run because there was one old bloke who was faster than me in my category. And the bastards followed me to Tooting. I can't, I can't believe, I mean, I don't know if it's him again. I keep looking for him. He must look much younger than me. But uh, anyway, so that this accessibility aspect the competitiveness is, is a, that's genius how you manage to do that. Because how can it, you know, normally when things are competitive, they're exclusionary. And when things are inclusive, they're a bit dull. And this is kind of like, I, you know what I mean. But, but you managed this combination. It's amazing. Well, it is amazing. And I think it was built in from day one. We did invite everybody. We said, come along with your dogs and your push chairs and all that sort of thing. And of course, on day one, they were a bunch of runners. And it was a race. But, I mean, we've got Derek in the room here who participates. He's, I think he's going to be getting his 50th any minute now. 70th. 70th, any minute. Okay, so he's getting his... And Derek watches the PB. I mean, Derek runs 40-odd minutes, but he's still interested in the PB. Yeah. I don't think there's a single person in the parkrun community who isn't interested in a PB. It doesn't matter whether that's at 59 minutes or it's at 45 minutes. Everybody is competitive. But what we do, I think we do it in a way that makes it acceptable for those who are super, super, super quick to race around the field and, and uh, feel whatever they feel. And for the rest of us, just to be that little bit competitive with our neighbor who we've noticed is just ahead of us. <laughs> yeah. And also, I, I have to get in front of the aggressive push chair pushers. Uh, <laughs> Because it's, so, it's really hard getting past them. Um, there's one bloke who goes, he, he's really fast and he pushes and he chunters all the way around. So he's like, he's got the push chair, he's faster than me, and he's talking to his kid all the way around. It's like, uh, he's brilliant. Um, uh, kind of final couple of questions. Um, but the, 
because there is a bit of purism. I, I heard a story that a council wanted to charge a pound a person. That's you right. weren't having any of that, were you? No, this was a <laughs> defining moment in Parkrun's uh, history. So the team, uh, not particularly me, the team uh, worked with the council to get to a position where they would understand what we stood for and what it would mean for the community for that event to not exist, what it meant for it to exist. And I think we got very, very close to getting a, a decent agreement, but at the last minute, the leader of that council uh, decided to force us on the issue. And as a result, we, we stood down. We said, okay, well, we're not ever going to charge anybody for a park run. It's free forever for mm -hmm. everyone. Absolutely. And that principal decision became a, a line in the sand, which I think many, many councils have contacted contact us since to confirm, <coughs> excuse me, to confirm that they will never charge. Yeah. So it's a, I think it's a really important principle at Parkrun and it's something that people hold on to and the, the kind of organization that we are, that's the values that are bre uh, breathed uh, bre uh, amongst the team and you know, that has to continue. So final question, you, you, you've talked about your ambition for the future, you know, and I think it's, I think you should be even more ambitious. I think your ambition should be that Saturday morning is just the time when the entire human race runs. <laughs> it just becomes like, you know, something we just all do together. What are the barriers do you see to getting to your uh, ambition in your 15-year ambition? Because one of the other bits of your genius is you spotted those barriers before, like when you handed over to Nick Pearson. You could see you had to do that. Are there things that could potentially stand in the way? Or is it plain sailing from here now you've reached your no. critical mass point? No. So, so I'll, be, I'll be clear that the, ba the, the targets I talked about are probably well within our reach, even if, even if we do not move to a very challenging country or a very challenging situation. There are things in place that will see the ship keep moving forward. However, we are now focused on delivering park runs in places in this country where they don't want them. Right. Those are our real barriers and our real challenges. So there are communities for, who, for whom running is alien. And if you did put a park run in their common, the people participating would come under an enormous amount of stress from their fellow, uh, the people they live with, because it's just not something that they do but we know that they need it because this will be the biggest health invention, uh, intervention in their lives. So there are lots of barriers and I'm grateful that I've got a team of 43 people who think about this every single day and they get prompted by the 200, 300, 400 ambassadors who are working on making this what we want it to be in the future. And then we get emails from the six million people out there who think it should be something different or that who have got an idea. So we constantly are receiving feedback and input, but we've got a great team who truly, truly understand the challenges that lie ahead. The people who took us to, for instance, the prisons, that wasn't my idea. These, these are the people who are driving Park Run forward. Is it now? You're We're in, how many custodial seats? Did I say 27, 27. Amazing. Amazing. And, and growing and growing. And, you know, the GP practice is just as important. Yeah. I mean, helping people to understand that getting outside and supporting, clapping a bunch of people running around the field can actually change your life. It's a big deal. Okay, uh, enough of me. Let's open it up to um, some of the people in the room. The only requirement is you tell us your name and also where you do your park run. Hi, uh, my name's Helen. I am a Wimbledon Common park runner, um, but try and go to as many different places as possible. Um, I was really interested about your point around sort of volunteering and the, the personal benefits that, that you get from volunteering. And I just wondered what your reflections were. Some people say uh, you volunteer because you're happy. Other people say you volunteer and you become sort of happier. Um, and just your reflections on that. Well, the people who know me well will tell you that morning is not my best time. <laughs> They'll also tell you that um, 
I still suffer with mental health issues, and, uh, and sometimes I find it incredibly difficult just to leave the house. Park run day is a day that comes quite easy to me, even though I feel the pressure of the park run world. Uh, people have expectations of me, and of course I'm never going to disappoint or, or let them down, but I feel all of that. But I can honestly say there's never been a park run day that I have attended where I haven't come away better off because of it. The volunteering is vital. I started this volunteering. I didn't run for the first number of years. I've been fortunate enough that as we've grown, um, I'm not required to be there every single day, but I still go down to our local junior park run and I do my volunteering there. And it's a very, very, very special thing to see a young person who has never run before in any way, shape, or form change their whole shape over a 10-week period when they go from being gangly and all over the place to becoming little runners. And it's wonderful to see. And there's, there's nothing more rewarding than being part of a team who are delivering that. Great. Who's next? <coughs> yeah. Hi, Paul. Hello. Hi. Hi. Yeah, I mean, it's been very... Tell us who you are and what you're Sorry, Jim Desmond. And so it's been very... Women than Common. So it's been oh. very good <laughs> reflecting on the transition from the early days where the focus on running more towards the volunteering and the other initiatives you've talked about, like the healthcare and the prisons and also other things you haven't mentioned, like the merchandise and the apricot kit that comes through. So you've talked about your numerical goals. I'd be interested to hear some of your thoughts about other goals you have for how Parkrun's character and personality might evolve, because it's not a static, it's clear not, and so it gives a sneak preview of what we might see in the future. And to add to that, we've, I've used the idea here, uh, Paul, because we're, we're big fans of deliberative democracy, which is the process whereby you get a kind of sample of the population and they come together and they deliberate on an issue. And we've been, I've used this idea of what would be park run for deliberative democracy, because at the moment, to do deliberative democracy is very expensive, because you've got to sample the population, et cetera, et cetera. It's very cumbersome. That's why these things like citizens' assemblies and citizens' juries are very rare. And I've been thinking, well, how, what were the principles that you might apply that where you could make it much, much easier for many more people to participate? Now, I'm not asking you to reflect on my idea, but in, in relation to this question, do you think there are other areas of life to which you could apply some of the principles of park run? Well... Thanks, Jim. Jim will know that in the... Uh, so Jim and Duncan were the two people I used to sit with once a month, every single month in the first year of Parkrun to discuss Parkrun. So he was there, not on day one, but maybe day two. So Jim, uh, Jim will know that uh, when Parkrun started to grow and get some cohesion and uh, adhesion, we got lots of requests from other governing bodies to come and tell us how parkrun works in a context of swimming. I've even had golf, <laughs> democratizing golf. I mean, golf's big issue is it's such an expensive, privileged uh, sport. And they've come and said, well, how can we democratize it? How can we get it out to the, the, the general public? I, I can tell you that I have no ambitions whatsoever to take it to any other field. I think parkrun is uh, my only focus, really, uh, apart from mental health, which is also something that I focus on. Um, I think that the parkrun team, the executive, are constantly in consultation with other organizations and bodies, trying to explain what we've talked about tonight, how this all works, how you can engage half a million volunteers and to get them to do it in a way that is constructive cooperative, etc. Um, I can also tell you that we've been doing that for the last 15 years and I can't think of a single body that's taken on what we've suggested they might take on. So you have to want to drink from the trough in order to get the pleasure of that drinking water and that doesn't always happen. I think from being a democratized um, Society, we, you know, we've got 2,000 events. Those 2,000 events all have a team. That team has a structure. That structure goes across, well, we're every country that we're in. Um, it wouldn't have been natural to the South Africans to have done 
volunteering, let alone in the team that we build. And so we're passing on lots of values all the time. We're receiving in return lots of suggestions, many of which we've considered ourselves over the years. And in the process, we're working with those people to understand perhaps why we would do something or not do something. And, and so this, is, this knowledge is getting out there. I'm not sure anybody's taken advantage of it yet, but uh, I mean, maybe the team knows better than I do. Any other? Yes. Are there communities that don't have a suitable public space for a park run? And what can we do as a community to help that? Hold on to that. We'll just take two more questions before we finish. So. Um, I was intrigued when you said you actually wrote the program that's still being used to time runners. And I wonder if uh, the fact that you were able to write a computer program was important as the fact that you're a runner to the success of park run. And then I've seen two more, one here and then one at the back. Hello, I'm, I'm Dave and I run at Hyde, <coughs> sorry, Hyde in the northwest, so I'm taking a bit further north. Just, you know, I, I think huge credit to you for the kind of ability that, of yourself, but also of lots of people involved with Park Run, to have that kind of fluency of talking about mental health problems. We know how difficult that can be. And I think, you know, just in terms of, you know, associated things that happen that aren't Park run kind of official you know i just want to say that the stuff that with me now podcast has done where the the, the presenters there just are so good at talking about mental health and making a difference and and it's, it's just brilliant to hear is there anything else that you've got planned in terms of how we do much better and how power run can play an even greater kind of effect on people with poor mental health and then at the back Hi, i run at richmond so um paul i'm interested in uh, your leadership so you obviously had a, a, a really big vision, and I'm wondering if there's anything that you wish you'd done differently along the way. Great. Do those, and then it'll all be over, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> so we need to start with you. And the question was... <laughs> Places that don't have anywhere oh, to okay. run. Okay. Yep. Absolutely. I mean... We're very, very, very fortunate in this country that uh, we do have public spaces and parks and beaches and so on. Uh, America has an absolute dearth of um, public spaces. So if you look at this country, I would imagine that there are many, many places uh, where it wouldn't be natural for us to run a park run. But I think over the years, we've been very clever about finding acceptable places, places where, for instance, we can do a five-lapper or a six-lapper. If you take our custodial sites, now there's an excellent example of how the team has been forward-thinking. So custodial sites, uh, they might have to run 20 times around a field, going around fences and all sorts of, in order to get the 5K done. So uh, I, I'd say absolutely we know that this is a challenge. The further we go, the more that will be a challenge. Uh, there'll be some countries we'll go to where they just will not have these spaces, and we're going to have to find ways to do it. The one thing we've always insisted on is that it's always safe. So we're not going to put people at risk by creating a park run that isn't safe. I think that will always be a founding um, principle. Technology. I mean, the thing about Parkrun's technology is it works. I mean, you know, I'm so used to technology that doesn't work or doesn't isn't reliable. And and ever since, and this starts with you writing that first program. So it's true. I did I did uh, write the first um, of our systems. The the database was designed by me, and that very very first we called it a volunteer management system. Uh, that was mine. We've had a rewrite of those systems over the years. There's some very clever people involved and. But the basic concepts stay the same. What we try to do, we accept that uh, there are teams out there who need to be able to do a job, and they need to do it well. So we provide the tools that mean that they can do it, and we give them accountability, and we give them authority to do quite a lot of things that perhaps other organizations might have restricted. We trust people. We think that, as I said in my speech, people are good. 
And 99.9% .9 of the time, that's proven to be true. And so you can trust people and you can give them power and accountability. And they do like to work okay. within a framework. Do people ever cheat? Yes, of course. Do they? Of course. To get a better time. Do we care? No, no, of course not. I'm just, I'm just intrigued. Honestly, <laughs> I mean, you, you've run on many courses and you've seen that uh, some courses are exactly 5K long, some are maybe a little bit longer, some a little bit shorter. We try the to get it. I do a little bit longer, I we think. We try to uh, get it right. Uh, that explains but you, it. <laughs> but you could go around a corner a little yeah, yeah, bit yeah, sharp. Yeah, I see, I see, I see. Yeah, so we're not a race in that sense no, no, and no. we try not to govern how people participate in that sense. We try to treat people like they're adults and they're accountable and they need to make their own decisions. The question about, about uh, uh, mental health, the importance of that, and whether there's more you want to... Well, I mean, mental health is a really, really important part of what you hear in society at the moment, and I think Parkrun is trying to play its part, and I think the team understand where I come from, they understand how vulnerable I am to these things, and I think they've learned that it's not just me, but actually it's everybody in the team. Everybody has a good day. Everybody has a bad day. Some people have more bad than good. And it's about understanding that without making it sound like you're giving people uh, big soft rooms that they don't bash into walls and stuff. Those challenges are still there. We want everybody to be the best they possibly can be. And what we want to do is to guide and help people be there. I'm not sure what new initiatives will come from Parkland, but you can be sure that this is not going away. This is part of what we stand for. And, you know, we look to help people move up. We've many, many occasions where I've seen a very timid young person take the loud hailer to park run and address a group of people becoming, over time, bold and full of uh, courage, full of the ability... I mean, I wish I'd been... Uh, given a loud halo when I was 14. I might be able to speak properly at these <laughs> events. <laughs> so. And uh, finally, Ali. mistakes. Uh, things that, that... What could I have done differently? Yeah. Well, I could have just stayed in bed. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, it's, I mean, it's clear that I have leadership skills, but I'm not your traditional leader. I think that there are lots of people in this room who are far better leaders than I am. What I had was perhaps a little bit of chutzpah, uh, drive, a willingness to tell somebody to leave me alone, I'm getting on with this, not to listen to the naysayers, but at the same time to perhaps consider the good advice that I was given. I didn't always take it straight away. It, sometimes it took me a while to do that. As far as Parkrun concern, is concerned, I don't think I made any mistakes. I think it is what it is because of I started it. I mean, and we grew day by day, and we changed day by day. And if I look back, I think um, I honestly feel I have a legacy that most people would die for. So I'm very, very grateful for Parkrun. And we're very grateful for it, too, uh, Paul. So um, you didn't have a coda to your speech, but if you had, I think I would have suggested my favourite quote, which keeps coming back into my mind and is all, all the way through this event. Uh, and that's a quote which is, it's not hope that leads to action, it's action that leads to hope. And I think you absolutely exemplify uh, that principle. Please stay with us. Uh, we're having a drink uh, downstairs, and you can have a non-alcoholic drink as well as an alcoholic drink. I want to emphasize that. Um, and carry on your conversations and compare your times. That probably, <laughs> probably isn't possible to do an impromptu park run because the room isn't quite big enough. Um, thank you all for coming. It's been an incredibly special evening, and it just remains for me to ask you to join me in thanking the winner of the 2019 RSA Albert Medal, Paul Sinton Hewitt. Thank you.